Thank you. I come uh, with great tidings of joy uh, from uh, the UK. They all, they all say hi and they say they love you. Um, <laughs> And I'm going to broadly talk about public health, uh, which has been touched upon actually very helpfully by Brandon and Jason and to some extent by Peter as well. So um, I call this public health historical and modern value conflicts. So of overriding importance to any society's security and integrity is the integrity and development and flourishing of its own public health. Uh, this is true whether we define that society as a village community, um, a city, a nation, uh, or the aggregated global population. Uh, as referenced here, public health doesn't just mean physical health of individual humans within that collective, uh, that being broadly the body's ability to cope with and react to invasive infection or disease, and to build up a library of immunity, if you like, of known illnesses. Uh, but on a, a wider level, the social level of public health should be considered as an aggregated immune response system of a society itself. Um, on this level, public health could be broadly characterized as the ability of a society to recognize, prepare for, and uh, defend against larger survival uh, and uh, life quality threats uh, to its uh, structure and to its population's own functional integrity. So the broader system of public health uh, integrity encompasses many interlocking levels, not all of them strictly medical or scientific even. Uh, those that are medical include, of course, research and development uh, of treatments known uh, and existing ailments, preventive healthcare efforts such as uh, checkups uh, on national or local levels, uh, genetic research to predict family or group immunities or predispositions to certain illnesses, and uh, the broad coordinated sharing of information uh, about disease and communicable ailments and so forth. Particularly with reference to uh, common health threats, the modern science of epidemiology can be traced back to the emergence of the priority of public health as a broad issue in London around the 1800s. Uh, at this time, large urban populations began to amass, and so the necessary safeguards for close proximity living and health stability needed to be ensured for the continuance of the rapidly growing cities. Uh, epidemiology as a science and public health as a priority set are implicitly modes of plurality, the sort of models of plurality. They exist as sort of layers of societal logic based on environmental feedback and the, the goal of group stability. Uh, their successful effects are the generalized improvement of all, uh, not based on class or arbitrary division. Data is collected and contributed to by the many for the many. Uh, and then there are the sort of less direct medical factors of culturally promoted lifestyle, both of the uh, dominant consumption habits and individual choices, which, as Brandon also said, also comes from the society. Um, and, you know, levels of exercise, the level of stress which is borne upon uh, by the population and so forth. Uh, on the more oblique levels are matters of sort of healthcare policy, uh, the value placed on availability of si uh, systems of public health and well-being, and initiatives directed at solutions to health issues, housing, work environments and all, and, uh, and which are all, of course, uh, essentially imbricated with the overall uh, bio-psychosocial uh, culmination of what becomes general public health. Of course, much of this collective support can be made totally redundant by a few economic and social premises which prioritize values in a manner contrary to the logic of shared and generalized systems. For example, if a society's economic factors have the effect of determining that the availability of health-enhancing treatments or non-stressful lifestyles uh, are only available to a particular class or set of classes, uh, the groundwork upon which public health and epidemiology rests actually just falls at the first hurdle. Uh, or if a, a known impending danger to a society is ignored in favor of business interests, then there is no public health system at all, uh, since any preventative uh, responses or precautions are essentially rendered null and void by their non-implementation. Uh, and this is actually true even if there is a general recognition uh, that social health priorities are important. In fact, if you've sort of been nodding your head quietly this whole time uh, that I've been speaking, thinking that this all sounds rather obvious, it's because there isn't really anyone who doesn't think that the arena of public health isn't in some way integral to the function of uh, the logic of a society. Um, the last general point here I want to make is, uh, at the outset, uh, at the outset um, true systems of public health integrity also differentiate themselves from, and are in fact, I think, set against the so far dominant uh, competitive market model of human social operation, uh, as well as the dominant way in which we think about rights and entitlements for members of society, and those differentiate themselves in, in a few important ways. So public health is a, about a different kind of human right. 
Uh, we often hear talk of the freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom to assemble, freedom of dissent, and so on. Uh, the resulting impact of optimal and successful public health uh, actions are conversely freedoms from. Uh, freedom from disease, freedom from regular food poisoning, uh, freedom from the early corrosion of your nerves through socially imposed stress, for example. Um, uh, freedom from violent attack by psychosocially wounded individuals driven to dissonance with their society through unmet needs and value distortions. <laughs> freedom from dying of cholera yesterday. Okay? Uh, these freedoms are marked by an, a sort of an absence, an, an absence of a, a negative retroaction, rather than an ability for a particular action to take place, like the freedom to assemble, for example, which you do so well in the US with the freedom of speech zones. Um, <laughs> sorry, we're the same. <laughs> the effects of public health are felt in the promotion of an improved standard of physical and mental health. They are the results of preventive health. Uh, now, in this sense, the benefits can seem a little invisible uh, within public discourse, especially in a society that reinforces and rewards behavior through a series of positives or if-then scenarios. Uh, if you work, you will get paid. Uh, work hard and you'll get a raise or maybe extra holiday or a promotion. Work extremely hard and wear a suit every day and you'll get the Republican nomination and so forth. <laughs> Avoid working hard or well uh, and you would be forfeited your security. Break a society's rules and you'll be imprisoned and so on. Given these different criteria of results and priorities, it may not be that surprising that, and this is where I'm going to lose every free market advocate who might accidentally be watching this video, uh, but systems and social constructs which encourage public health and a generalized approach towards the promotion of functional life requirement are not achieved by the general free market activity at all, ever. Okay? Nor are they encouraged or enabled by them. In fact, public health as a discipline arose precisely because the laissez-faire attitude to social operation and the uncoordinated function of activity limited and even completely ignored the ability to avoid health dangers. If the priority set is profit-based or based on a particular power distortion generated by vested interest motivations, social interest is placed second. That is, it is not a factor at all. Now, history shows an almost constant battle between the sort of slowly emerging arena of public health and the inhibiting forces of poor public and academic education, a lacking awareness or understanding of various environmental effects by society in general, and, of course, the ever-present business interests of the time. Um, I'll borrow a few stories from Victorian England, which is the era that actually sort of birthed modern public health. Uh, the major plank in this, uh, in this um, era was the fight against the spread of cholera. So... The deadly strain of Asiatic cholera came to Britain in late 1831 and caused devastation and death for many years after, bringing with it the riots that had accompanied it, uh, accompanied the outbreaks in Russia and elsewhere. Uh, British medical professionals had actually known about this new strain of the disease from reports that preceded its advance uh, from the point of origin it had in Bengal, uh, taking as it did about 15 years to spread across uh, the Middle East and Europe before finding its way onto a ship which docked at Sunderland Port in North England. Now, it is already this early in the story of the Victorian cholera epidemics that we find one of the many examples of the value war between established societal power and the efforts of preventive health care and social immunity. At the time of the, impending, uh, uh, of the sort of impending and expected epidemic, King William IV himself stated that he had directed that all the precautions should be taken, which experience has recommended as most effectual for guarding against the introduction of so dangerous a malady into this country. One of the precautions was a 15-day quarantine of vessels entering from the Baltic to Sunderland. Uh, this was a major threat to business and financial stability, of course, and uh, the precaution ended up being watered down in a major way in practice by the rhetoric of the business community. Uh, Lord Londonderry, acting as the voice of the business community, stated, contrary to the alarm raised by the medical boards of the doctors, that Sunderland is now in a more healthy state than has been usual in the autumnal season. Good. The actions of Londonderry, which eased cholera's road into England, spreading north to Scotland, south to Oxford, and then to London, wiping out some 52,000 people, uh, were motivated and dictated by a value system analysis, uh, analysis which placed business with mainland Europe higher than medical safety. And while the ramifications and the mass death and the fight and the flight from stricken areas were not you know, expected by him, maybe, uh, and the disruptions to trade would have meant a vast impact upon Sunderland, 
which you know, had 14,000 paupers out of 17,000 people. Uh, you know, the point is that it's sort of widely agreed by historians that the business community loved to distort the statements from the doctors, claiming the whole thing was a conspiracy to cover up stolen cadavers for dissection by the medical community and so on. We see at work here the sort of social immune disorder born out of necessity to conduct business over everything else. And uh, I did say there was about 17,000 people in Sunderland, so they only wiped out almost four times that whole uh, city and the rest of uh, the UK. Uh, we also see this pattern and how it was actually defeated uh, in the long march towards the ultimate development of a resistance to and a solution for uh, the cholera pandemic. Uh, the going theory in the 1830s, which persisted as a general belief until practically the dawn of the 20th century, was that many illnesses, particularly cholera, uh, were trans uh, transmitted by sort of foul air. They called it a miasma, uh, which had arisen out of rotting matter. It took the concerted and clever work of a man called John Snow, an anaesthetist who lived in central London, to uh, uncover the analysis of death rate statistics provided to him by England's first, really, official uh, statistician, William Farr. Um, and, and that's how they really sourced the real cause of cholera and how it was being spread, which today we understand is, of course, the pollution uh, by the cholera bacillus carried in the water supply. And, uh, you know, not, in fact, the air foul, though it may have been, and indeed was. Uh, Snow actually noted that a violent outbreak of the disease centred around the communal pump in Broad Street uh, and his work with the local community, actually they removed the handle from the pump uh, and deaths dropped. Uh, partly because of that, partly because everybody else who could afford it ran away. Uh, so they uh, were accidentally helping themselves health-wise. Um, when years later William Farr, uh, now more convinced of the sort of waterborne theory of cholera transmission, lobbied against the heavy interests of the London water companies, trying to correctly lay blame at their door for failure in hygiene and all kinds of other hijinks they played, uh, he encountered the kind of resistance witnessed in Sunderland and which has been seen constantly in the modern day as well. Uh, Farr's words are actually worth repeating, partially because he wrote with the panache not normally attributed to a statistician. Uh, he said, as the air of London is not supplied like water to its inhabitants by companies, the air has had the worst of it. For air, no scientific witnesses have been retained, no learned counsel has, ple uh, has pleaded, I would say pled. Who am I to correct William Farr, however? Um, so the atmosphere has been freely charged with the propagation uh, and the illicit diffusion of plagues of all kinds, while Father Thames, deservedly reverenced throughout the ages, and the water gods of London have been loudly proclaimed immaculate and innocent. Uh, here you see the sort of comfortable shift, shift of blame onto media of communication, which uh, at the time could not be bought or sold, that being the air. And uh, we even have that bitter hint by far that the ruling companies occupy a position of almost theo-capitalistic reverence. Only after vast pressure by the population against the recalcitrant government, an uncooperative and censorious business community, and the construction of a whole sewer system under the supervision of engineer Joseph Bazalgette, who had kick-ass sideburns, you'll see, uh, was the systemic integrity of public health uh, in a position to actually combat uh, a cholera epidemic. We know that because in 1892, a massive cholera outbreak in Hamburg killed close to 9,000 people in six weeks. And yet in England, which was expecting it next, based on prior infection patterns, a small bout of cholera broke out, largely in areas not even covered by Bazalgette's system. This presented a, a sort of a major watershed as it's one of the first moments in public health that we can see an event by its relative non-occurrence. It's non-happening. Uh, the same sort of pattern has been since seen with the introduction of the occupation of midwifery, which was de decried by doctors as a threat to their job market. There you can see them being bad for the economy right there. And uh, <laughs> the resistance to the introduction of hand washing by, amongst others, a wonderful gentleman called Charles Meigs, who, betraying the thought genes of class and social standing doctrines implicit in his day, said that doctors are gentlemen and gentlemen's hands are clean. <laughs> he was a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Um, right, right up to the modern day, we have a similar pattern with the widespread prescription of antidepressants and antipsychotics, particularly to children, to nudge them into line with the generalized dissonant atmosphere into which they're born. According to Dr. David Healy, a noted psychiatrist, some 90% of school shootings in the US coincide with antidepressant treatment. To say nothing of the suppressed data by companies such as Eli Lilly on suicide levels related to serotonergic drugs, 
The collated adverse and unsustainable effects of stress treated with profitable patchwork drugs marks out our still present um, disconnect between true public health prioritization and the actual operation of social health support resulting from our value alignments within that social operation. Today's interest groups are bigger, smarter, and worst of all, in a way, they have more data about human behavior, which means they can, they can use that data to make advertising stronger, more subtle, and control public discourse in a, in a more enlightened age uh, than even during the more credulous times when we as a species knew much less about the physical as well as the psychological world. I'd like to suggest uh, the following small, very simple idea for improvement to combat this ideological and biopsychosocial misalignment. From primary school onwards, we teach public health education and public health history every year as an educational constant. Homeschoolers, relax and sit back down. Uh, you can do this at home as well. Uh, this module updates dynamically as new public health discoveries are made, and most importantly, we teach the failures as well as the successes of prior ages and of our own to inform the young of our fallibility of the evolution of knowledge, particularly in the medical arena. Those failures should be taught as just as important revelations to our way of thinking as the positive discoveries themselves that we make. Uh, the, the benefits, in my view, are, uh, are a better readiness to update our mindsets when it comes to new information, being aware of prior corrected knowledge, uh, and a positive side effect, uh, as it were, of this particular educational move, this sort of pedagogical disposition, if you like, uh, might just be the consequent diffusing of this nationalistic and insular view held by respective nations that their country is the best and that a certain nation is the greatest civilization there could be and all the other steadfast attitudes uh, towards the, uh, the current zeitgeist. Um, it's no accident, I don't think, that the nations which proclaim themselves as the greatest, which is pretty much all of them, the more they do that, the more out of date their systems seem to be and the slower the evolutionary process is. And of course, the thought gene mechanism for that is that, well, things are so awesome now, how could they ever get any better, right? If you build in the awareness, when it comes down to it, we as a species, no matter where we are situated, are only as good as our information up to that moment, and only as secure and free as the health systems and attitudes which align our well-being with the environmental challenges we face, and those allow us to be uh, in their direct and indirect consequences uh, safeguarded. And, and thus, you know, the, the, the vast undiscovered country of as yet unknown knowledge ahead of us has the potential to alleviate, to enrich, and to better inform the great structures of stability and harmony, uh, which are our consolation and the true lifeblood of our human tenure on this planet, both individually and collectively, if only we are ready to accept where they lead us. Many thanks.